Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the IP Integrated Product Design Program online info session. We are super to, excited to have you joining us here this morning. My name is Sarah Rottenberg, and I'm the Executive Director of the Integrated Product Design Program. I uh, lead the program and also teach many of the classes that you will be taking if you end up coming here at Penn. And so um, I'll be leading this info session, and I have with me Christine. Hi, I'm Christina Burton. I'm the Associate Director of Graduate Admissions Operations here at the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. So between myself and Christina, hopefully we'll be able to answer all of your questions. Um, what I wanna do, I have um, prepared a, a short presentation about the program, and then um, we're happy to answer any questions that you have about the program, about the admissions process or whatever. Um, before we get started, I would love to hear from you a little bit who you are, um, your background, and what you're particularly interested in learning about. Um, and then that way I can make sure I tailor the presentation to you. So I know it's always a little awkward with the Zoom, but if folks can just kind of jump in and introduce yourselves, that would be awesome. No, nobody wants to come in and say anything. You can unmute yourselves. Hi. <laughs> um, good morning. My name is Sarah, and I'm kind of interested in learning how the classes in between all the different schools work together. So particularly the curriculum um, and just kind of understanding um, kind of the collaboration process in between the three different schools. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Well, Sarah, you're Hello. distinguishing yourself as the most courageous <laughs> among our group so far. <laughs> Hopefully others will join you. Hello, my name is Celeste, and I'm a, I have a background in mechanical engineering, and I'm, I'm interested in learning more about the final project as well that we have in our curriculum. Just more information about that, too. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else want to jump in? Hi, uh, good morning, or in my case, actually, good afternoon. Um, I am calling in from Germany. My name is Julia. i um, been recently granted the Fulbright Scholarship. Looking for a good master program in the US this fall. Uh, I'm interested to find out how the IPD um, is different from a lot of similar programs. Um, I'm also, also looking at the CMU and Northwestern. Um, and then also about the chances for uh, additional scholarships uh, and finances in general that would be awesome to hear a little more about that thank you julia uh so here's uh kubi uh kubi from germany as well um i'll be applying to the program uh by the deadline and uh, i'm a business student and i have one year of work experience so i would like to know more about what's the program like for the business students with uh, not design backgrounds and uh, also uh, maybe some tips or guidelines about the portfolio or how other students of yours have managed to successfully create one and then <laughs> get into the program. So anything and everything about that. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Kubi. Okay, I think a few of you have uh, mentioned some things in the chat. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and there'll be plenty of chances to ask more specific questions as we get through things. Um, one of the reasons that I like folks to do to introduce themselves is you can start to see even already, I think one of the most distinguishing characteristics of the program, which is bringing in students from different backgrounds and different levels of experience. Um, and so while that can be a challenge from a curricular perspective, because we want everyone to get up kind of to the same level at some point in um, at least the design process and in how design engineering and business um, uh, 
uh, are manifest in the design process. Um, it's also, I think, one of the strongest assets of the program because we really give you a lot of opportunities to collaborate with people from different backgrounds and to learn from each other. Um, and I think that's a, a huge part of the student experience. Um, so I'll go ahead and jump into, I'm going to share my screen and jump into a presentation. It'll take probably 20, 25 minutes. You can feel free to interrupt me and ask questions as I go along and I will do my best to um, answer the questions that you guys have already um, asked along the way. Um, so Integrated Product Design at Penn is, um, as you know, as I just mentioned, a collaboration between design, engineering, and business. Um, and we really see ourselves at the, the sweet spot in the center of those areas. So my um, appointment is actually in the School of Design. The program technically sits in the School of Engineering. And our new building that we're going to be moving into in the fall is a Wharton School of Business building. Um, and so the different schools come into play in terms of like you have access to resources across the schools um, and you have accesses to, access to take classes across the three schools um, in addition to kind of the core IPD um, studio. So this is kind of the pretty picture of how the disciplines integrate. Um, and this is more what it looks like in real life. Um, it's a little bit messy. It's the overlap between the disciplines is not uh, perfect lines. Um, and there's a lot of uh, interesting complications that happen when you're moving between the disciplines and when you're working across the disciplines. One thing is communication. So a word like prototype might mean one thing in the School of Engineering, another thing in the School of Design, and another thing in the Business School. And I think one of the biggest assets that we offer to our students is to learn those languages. And then when they graduate, they often play the role of translators across disciplines and they're able to lead and work with teams that are interdisciplinary. And for any of you who um, work know, um, it's very rare that a, a, a meaty, interesting project really relies on the strengths or skills of only one discipline. And so we're really trying to teach our students how to um, create and design and implement products in the real world, um, which requires those interdisciplinary um, skill sets and communication skills. Um, sometimes what that looks like in practice is a class like this in a very traditional classroom setting. Um, this is a classroom in Huntsman and students are giving presentations and uh, PowerPoints. Sometimes it looks like this, um, very hands-on um, interacting with objects and making things. This is a picture in the current fabri fabrication lab in the Meyerson building, which is a school of design building. This is not a real picture, but it's a rendering of the new makerspace that you guys will have access to in the new building that we're moving into. So um, this is a makerspace that's being run by the School of Engineering and will be led actually by an IPD alum. Um, <clears throat> our students will have access to this, which is kind of a big open space with lots of low tech um, making uh, tools. And then in the building also will be kind of more high tech and advanced tools for making. Um, so we're really excited about, um, you know, if you just look between this one and the, the new space, one thing that we'll have is windows. Um, so we also just have a lot more space um, to support the kind of work that our students in the program do, which we're really excited about. Um, the core of the program and the core of the curriculum is really teaching a human-centered design process. Um, so you may have seen that three bubble diagram that I showed with these words in it. It's about bringing in desirability from a design perspective and really understanding what is meaningful to people, what matters to people, and how to design products and services that they can engage with, that they want to engage with and interact with, but also bringing in viability from a business perspective. How do you create a sustainable business model? And feasibility from an engineering perspective. How do we think about what technologies will be available today and in the future and leverage those technologies to deliver the optimal experience? 
Um, I think in some ways this diagram here also represents the, the way that the curriculum works. So there's this core IPD curriculum that runs through the program, the studio courses. And then in addition to that, students layer on their classes from design, engineering, and business that allow them to deepen their knowledge in each of the disciplines and also kind of gives you an opportunity to tailor the program to suit your needs. So if you um, really wanna focus on IOT and robotics, you can take design classes that are focused on smart objects and engineering classes that are focused on that. Um, and even business classes that are focused on those topics. If you're really interested in user experience design or more digital design, you can tailor your classes um, to suit that interest. So um, I think it's a nice balance between a very core structured curriculum where we make sure that everybody leaves with um, a, a strong skill set and then an adaptable curriculum that lets you get what you want to get out of the program. Um, this is where I get trapped. Why can I not? Oh, there it is. Um, okay, I'm actually going to slip this slide. So, um, given that we, are, I know we have folks from different backgrounds on the call, um, there are two variants of the IPD degree. Uh, students take the same core studio courses, depending on which variant. Um, no matter which variant you take, but the electives that you take are slightly different. So the MIPD is open to students from design, engineering, or business backgrounds, and it provides a much more interdisciplinary perspective and the ability to take um, more courses from the School of Design and um, in business. Uh, the MSEIPD is for students with an undergraduate degree in engineering who really want to understand integrated product design and want a better understanding of the whole design process but um, really expect to graduate still in a role as an engineer. So maybe you wanna be a design engineer or something like that. Um, and then in the MSE degree, you would take more classes in engineering. You would still take one business and one design class, but the majority of your courses would be in engineering. Um, so that's the real difference between the degrees. In truth, I am not sure that anyone outside of these walls really um, understands or cares about the difference. But I think for you, if you're debating which program is the right fit, really thinking about which classes you want to take and which degree um, affords you the opportunity to take those classes is a good way to make a decision. Um, no matter what background you come from, we want to make sure that all of our students have some basis in design and engineering and in business. And so we have foundation classes that most students take one foundation class. Some students end up taking two foundation classes to kind of get up to speed in the disciplines that aren't their background. Um, this is a picture of the engineering foundation class. So someone with a business background would take the engineering foundation and the design foundation. Um, those are both summer classes. Um, these people that you see in this picture smiling happily are thrilled because their robots are all standing up, at least in the picture. Um, so it's a four week intensive intro to um, engineering for people who have never studied engineering and want to do product design that culminates in a project where you will um, build a robot um, and code it. And these are all, I think for the past couple of years, it's been about um, creating robots that move and react to external stimulus. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit of a steep curve, I'm not gonna lie, it's an intense four weeks, but we can get students to um, learn a baseline of skills in that discipline. There's also a foundation class in business and there's also a foundation class in design. The engineering and design foundations take place over the summer about a month before classes start. So that's just something to think about if you think you're gonna be required to take that class. Um, think about that in terms of planning. Um, and even though it's intense, you will end up smiling, um, at least at some point. Um, as I mentioned, the core part of the curriculum is really the studio curriculum. What that looks like in year one in the fall is a class called design process, which is really about um, getting you to think differently about how you approach problem solving and creativity and how that manifests in physical form. So you are doing a lot of design, building, prototyping, making. Um, if you've never done that before, you will have at least taken the design foundation class and this is kind of your second studio. Um, and it's really about starting to think strategically about how do I um, generate new ideas and implement those ideas successfully and pay attention to um, 
things like material and form and craft and things like that. In the second semester, the class that just started yesterday, actually, we take a step back and say, why would you design that in the first place? It's a class called Problem Framing. That class is really focused on uh, design strategy and research, design thinking. Um, it's a lot of uh, learning how to build empathy with your end users, generate a wide variety of ideas, prototype and test those ideas to see what's the right fit. Um, the first semester is always a physical product. The second semester, we start with a four week digital product sprint. Um, and then the second project is always a client project where we partner with Penn Medi Medicine and local nonprofits. And it's very focused on the process and not the outcome. So the things that students design are whatever the problem requires. So sometimes it's digital, sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's service design, um, but it's really about learning how do you um, understand needs and translate those needs into implications for solutions. Um, and then the second year is the final project. Um, so that is a, it's basically a two semester sequence. We start again with a sprint um, to remind students after the summer that they have skills and abilities and give you a chance to get your head back in the game. Um, and then students pick topics that they're interested in and form teams around those topics and then spend the year working through, excuse me, the design process focused on that topic. So they start with empathy and need finding and ideation and end with a product that is fleshed out from a design and engineering and business perspective. Um, that's the class that if you have an entrepreneurial bent, many students um, work on things that they think they might then turn into real products and services and real companies after they graduate. Certainly not all students, um, but it is really an opportunity for you to explore something that you're interested in, um, in great depth. And again, it's a team experience, which I think is really important. We try to pair our students with, um, with complementary skill sets so you can really leverage each other's strengths and then it's long enough too that there's opportunity for you to say you know what i don't have an engineering background but i really want to learn how to code and so if there's a coding part of your project you have time to take that on um, and drive your own learning a little bit through that project um, so i'm gonna make it a little more concrete and then i'll open it up to questions here so this is an example of a project from the first semester studio as i said it's a physical project and often we collaborate with the philadelphia museum of art has a design competition and so often the projects from this semester result in entries to the competition the image you see on the screen is something that won that year um, the brief was to design a piece of furniture that affords storage and is informed by the design aesthetic of british Patricia Urquiola, who's a Spanish designer. Um, and this is, a, it's called TBD and it's a hamper. And so the, the big part with the purple lid is for clothes that are dirty. And the kind of more sculptural part is for those things that are not dirty enough to put in the hamper, but not clean enough to put back in your closet. You know, that stuff that we all have. Um, so that's a great example of that class. So it was, you know, there's a lot of thought about who's going to use it and how they're going to use it, but there's also a lot of emphasis on the physical design of the product. And this was definitely, um, the result of a very wide ranging ideation, both for the concept originally, and then also what does it finally look like and what form does it take? Um, as I mentioned, we often partner with Penn Medicine for the second semester studio. Um, and these are um, projects that um, the topic that they gave us was, how could we get younger people to think about planning for end of life? So things like advanced directives, so they can't, they can be kind of intense topics. We always give students a choice about what projects they want to work on. So we wouldn't force you to work on a project about end of life unless you're interested in it. Um, but this year we actually had two teams who were interested in it. They did a ton of research. And one of the things that they found was it actually doesn't make sense for young people to have advanced directives because the kinds of things that could happen to them are so all over the place and hard to predict that the advanced directives are unlikely to be incredibly accurate or helpful. But what is incredibly helpful is for people to have conversations with their friends, family, and loved ones to so that in the terrible event that something happens, that other people know how to make decisions for them. So the students, um, one student team ended up coming up with kind of a campaign just to get people talking about, um, about end of life planning. 
Um, and so they did, um, they put up a mirror on bathroom walls um, saying like that, that mimicked what it would look like to be on life support. They put up stickers, they created an Instagram account, a Snapchat account called Planning Your Death. And then they kind of prototype those, put those out in the world to see if that seeded the kinds of conversation that they're looking for. Um, a different team um, ended up designing a game that friends could play that has increasingly um, intense topics um, that just kind of drives a conversation to more serious things. And so in this case, it was about really having this insight about it's about driving conversation, not driving people towards advanced directives, and then experimenting with different solutions to see which ones would help them achieve the goal. Um, this is an example of the, the first little sprint in the second semester studio. Um, this is often a client project. One year um, I was the client and the students designed swag for the program. So this is a really beautiful cord holder. That's usually like a very quick design sprint that is a physical product. Um, but we quickly move into the projects that the students are gonna spend most of a year working on. Um, and again, because the students pick the topic, there's a really wide range of things that they work on. So in the top left-hand corner, you can see Weatherlist. Um, that was a product that was designed to help people um, be better at preparing for disasters. So the year that the students worked on this project, there was terrible hurricanes in Texas, Puerto Rico, and Florida. The student team actually traveled to Texas and interviewed um, responders and people who had um, a lot of hurricane damage to understand like what what could have helped them prepare better and they ended up designing this combination of a physical product and an app that the physical product lives in your house all year round and tells you the weather so you start to learn to trust it if it tells you it's gonna rain you bring an umbrella it rains you're like oh maybe i should believe this thing on my wall um, and then it also has um, a series of alerts for when there's going to be more extreme weather and it's paired with an app that walks you through the planning and prep process and it helps you visualize how far along you are on the process um, and the goal here is to encourage people to plan and prep better um, the project below that called Hint was designed for um, looking at how could you make getting, a getting your first period less traumatic for young girls. Um, and the team did a lot of research and found that not just getting your period, but for the first few years, managing your period was really challenging for young girls um, and tracking and remembering to bring your stuff with you. Um, so there's a lot of tracking apps out there, but most people who start using them don't continue to use them. So what this team designed was a little pouch where you could keep your tampons or pads um, and it has a passive tracker in um, inside that tracks when you open it and can start to detect patterns of usage. And so then the, the package can remind you that you're going to get your period so you don't have to remember to track it yourself. Um, and what I love about this is it's um, really designed to fit into context. So as you can see in your pocket, hanging in a bathroom stall, um, they really considered all different contexts of use for young girls. And this, again, is a product that comes with an app that um, girls can use to learn more about what's going on with their bodies. Um, I'm just going to talk about, well, maybe I'll talk about two more. Jarvis, the upper um, right-hand corner, um, is one that's a little far farther out technologically. This team was looking at how could they improve the diagnosis process for ADHD, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, which um, is a big problem here in the US. And right now the diagnostic is very qualitative. And so they talked to a lot of clinicians who said it would be great to have quantitative metrics. Um, so the device that you see in this picture is a works like prototype, not a looks like prototype. It's bringing together EG monitoring and um, VR to do testing that is, and eye tracking actually, to do testing that brings in quantitative metrics and also helps simulate natural environments that kids will be on in so they can get a better sense of how a kid would behave in a classroom, not just in a doctor's office. Um, and this is an example of something where the technology is farther out, so they couldn't actually complete, they have renderings of what they wanted to look like and the works like prototype, but they couldn't quite bring it together yet which is absolutely okay. Um, okay, I think that's the last one I'll talk about. Any questions about um, the IPD curriculum, the studio sequence, or the final projects that I haven't addressed? Hello, uh, this is from Celeste. Yep. 
I was wondering, um, usually, if we would like to pick a project from an outside sponsor, usually how many projects are available? And um, when, what is the process of learning about the different projects available and choosing one? That's a great question. So for in the first year, in that second semester, we source projects from outside sponsors. And usually I, we have like eight projects and then students choose their top two or three. For the final project, we don't tend to have outside sponsors. Um, for years, we did source projects for students and IPD students generally want to work on projects that they want to work on and are less interested in outside sponsors. Um, so there's not really a rigid process for that. However, um, there are definitely sometimes students who say, you know what, I'd really rather work on a client project. And then we work with them and we work with our networks to source those projects. So in the bottom left hand corner, you can see the, the thing with the purple glove and the device, um, Umbria. That was a project that um, the students wanted to work in healthcare and they really wanted to work with an external client. Um, I myself and other faculty have a lot of great relationships across a wide variety of in industries. And so in this case, we paired them with a physician who was looking at um, urine measurement and urine management. And that physician got them access to the medical ICUs at the university and they did their research there and then um, developed the product to kind of fit that brief. So it's definitely a possibility, but it's not the norm. Um, I know that a lot other universities do a lot of sponsored projects, but um, our sponsored projects happen in different classes than the final projects, typically. Oh, thank you. Sure. Hi there, this is Samira speaking. Hi, Sarah. Hello. Oh, hi yeah. there. I um, thank you for covering everything so far. I, <clears throat> I wanted to ask about how the IPD program um, prevents or helps to prevent, um, you know, the separation of people having business and engineering and design backgrounds um, from one person just doing the business side of things, one person just doing the engineering side of things, and one person just doing the design. Because I'm looking at a project like Jarvis, which is very technologically advanced, and I'm wondering if all three or all six or however many people were involved in the de development of the tool and also in the business and also in the design of it. Yeah, that's a great question. So one thing is we try to keep our teams on the small side between three and four people. And I think that actually really helps um, because at that size team, everyone has to do a little bit of everything. You can't just farm it out like that. Um, so the other thing is in the everybody's taking classes across the disciplines. And in the first year, everybody's doing um, all of the different facets of the design process. So everybody has some skills and then certain people have more skills. So with Jarvis, for example, that team ended up with two folks from engineering backgrounds and one person from a design background. There wasn't someone from a business background on the team. Um, and so they divided the work amongst themselves. In this case, the person from the design background really wanted to lead the design process. And the folks from engineering process were perfectly happy to let them do it. There was, they, this team actually did two products and there was a ton of engineering work for them to do. And then the engineers kind of divided up the work based on who wanted to learn what um, and who wanted to get more experience doing what. And then they all were very involved and engaged in the business work. Um, the other thing that happens is that at different parts of the process, different um, members of the team kind of need to take a leadership role. So we try to work with the students to be really articulate about who, um, what discipline should be leading at what time and how they can kind of share leadership capabilities across um, a, a project and over time, if that makes sense. Um, in the, I'm trying to think of a different example. Oh, like in the, um, count, which is the bottom, let's go, let's go 
yeah. Oh, you have you see the, the you see the names. I don't. Um, in count that team actually the woman who had a business background really wanted to drive. Um, really wanted to work on visual design. So in addition to the physical design of the product, she partnered with um, with the person with a design background and they did the design of the physical object. And then they also did a lot of kind of packaging design and information design because those were skills that they wanted to really push forward. So again, with these projects, we try to help the teams think about what do you know? What do you really want to learn and get better at? And how do you pick a project topic? to do that? And then how do you um, think about the development of your product in order to enable everybody to kind of build the skills that they really want to work on? All right, thank you. Sure. Other questions? Oh, I have one more question regarding the same topic. Um, would it be valuable for us to state in our application of topics that we would be interested pursuing for the final project or like yeah. some of our interests if yeah if you if you think you know what your interests are you could app i'm always interested in learning about like what do, what do you think you want to explore <laughs> But I, we certainly wouldn't hold you to it. And I would assume that that might evolve over time. Right. Um, but it is helpful for us to understand, oh, this is the kind of design that they're interested in. These are the kinds of topics that they want to be working in. Um, that's always helpful, actually. OK, thank you. Sure. Um, OK. I'm going to move on, and then we'll have time for more questions. OK. Oh, so this is a deep dive on the um, a bigger picture of of hint that kind of shows all the different contexts. Um, I'm not going to talk about this. Oh, so I mentioned that some students end up launching companies based on their final projects. Um, and the one that's gotten the most press lately is this Leah Diagnostics, which is a flushable pregnancy test. So the students had had the idea in in the program, had taken it, you know, as far as you can in <laughs> in a, two semesters as a school project. And then a couple months after they graduated, they were like, this is too good for us just to let it go and take jobs. And so they started a company. Um, they are based here in Philadelphia. They're actually um, renting space at Penovation for their factory right now. They are um, in production of the product. They've raised a seed round and a series A round of funding um, and they're doing really great. Um, and it's definitely not, again, not something we, we don't say like everyone from IPD should be entrepreneurs because it's really hard um, and you shouldn't do it unless you really want to. But um, there's a lot of opportunities that our students can connect with on campus in the School of Engineering through Wharton Entrepreneurship. Um, there's a lot of interest here in um, entrepreneurial activities. So a lot of our students end up, even if they don't end up launching the company when they graduate, participating in um, hackathons or competitions to kind of push their ideas forward and can get a ton of resources from the university as they do that, if that's something that they're interested in. Um, so switching gears a little bit, that was kind of the core studio classes, but students take a lot of classes outside of that. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about that. So the faculty in IPD is a combination of academics who are based here at Penn full time doing cutting edge research in their field and practitioners out there in the world who are um, doing either starting their own companies or have consultancies um, who, are, who are doing work with clients. Um, and we think that that mix is incredibly valuable for students. And you do have access to, to faculty from engineering, design, and Wharton. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's a great way to kind of tailor the degree to meet your interests, um, is to tailor the kinds of classes you take. Um, and that also enables you to build relationships with faculty. Um, a lot of our IPD students in the second year end up um, TAing for various classes around the university. Um, so this is one class that's a requirement for engineering students and an elective for um, non-MSE IPD students, which is mechatronics. Um, it's an intense engineering class that's focused on integrating mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and computer science 
it used to, I need to update my slides. It used to culminate in a Robaki tournament. Um, the students would create three robots and then the teams of robots would compete against each other. Now it's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's uh, uh, the robots that fight each other. Um, Anyway, um, it's a really intense class that students- Not battle bots? Battle bots, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just blanked. Oh, and this year an IPD student team won with a robot that they named after me. Yes. Um, so the Sarah Rottenberg robot was triumphant, which made me really happy. Um, it's, as you can see from this picture, it's like, it's a really hard class. It's really intense from an engineering perspective, but people get really into it and put a lot of time and energy into it. Um, and it's a really fun course. We have definitely had students not from engineering backgrounds take the class and thrive in it, um, but it's intense for everyone. Thank you for the battle box. Um, another class that's a design class that uh, many of our students take is um, it's called Cultures of Making Biological Design. It's with a professor in fine arts named Orkan Telhan, who's really interested um, not in biological design like biomimicry, but in designing with biological materials. And so this was a project where students were looking at um, how could they think about um, air filtering and using biological materials for that. And it turns out that spider webs are really amazing air filters. So they designed this system where you could harness the um, the webs from the spiders and then you can put it into the filter that you're wearing. Um, their initial designs, the spiders were living in the face mask, um, but it turned out people were not that excited about that. Um, so this class is, it's a bit more on that conceptual design perspective, but really thinking in the future, what kinds of uh, materials could we be using in order to um, design things that are more symbiotic with nature. Um, this is also from a class in um, a design class in in the School of Design. Um, it's an information visualization class. This class is really focused on a combination of visual expression and light coding. Um, and so you can see here these graphs represent uh, two different people's sleep patterns. Um, and the student ended up designing pillows that um, showcase the sleep patterns and that they have on their bed. Um, the outputs from this class are super diverse. So I've seen students do posters. I've seen them do pillows. Pillows is probably the weirdest thing they've made. Um, but videos, um, all kinds of things that um, get at the visualization of information and the translation of data into meaningful information that people can understand. Um, so that's a really popular class among amongst IPD students. Um, it's funny, I don't have a word example. So there's also, actually, before I jump into this, um, what's kind of cool about the classes and the fact that we're always drawing on classes from across the university is that new classes come up all the time. Um, there's now an undergraduate design major that is creating all kinds of new classes at the undergrad and graduate level. Um, so our students are tapping into those classes. Um, there's also, you know, constantly new classes that students are finding and saying, oh, do you think this makes sense for IPD? Um, and so if you go on our website, you can see our course list. It's a pretty good sampling of what's available today. Um, but know that that list changes and evolves, um, I think, a surprising amount. I'm always surprised at how quickly our list becomes outdated um, because new classes are being added. Um, in terms of, I think there was a question about how students kind of integrate classes from across um, the disciplines. I would say that um, it, it's, it's a lot about conversations about where students wanna go and what classes they wanna take um, that they have with myself and other advisors and other students. Um, and then they kind of put together a plan of study that makes sense for them. Um, based on their interests. Um, there's also a lot of opportunities to do extracurricular classes. So the image you see on the screen now is um, extracurricular activities, um, is a plate that was designed initially actually in 799 as our design sprint. Um, I had a client come to me asking for a plate to be designed for middle school kids who they were trying to get to try more new healthy foods. Um, Philadelphia public schools have a lot of kids who are living in poverty, um, who don't have very healthy eating habits. And one of the challenges is that their parents who might not have a lot of money to spare 
are um, a little bit risk averse when they buy food. So they're not gonna buy new foods because it can often take kids 10 tries of a food in order to enjoy it. So there's a, some programs in the Philadelphia public school system that's about introducing new foods and trying to establish healthier food habits with um, middle school kids. So this was a pro project that started there in class. Um, this is just some images of the design process of, um, we had six student teams each design a plate. Uh, the client chose the best two that they liked best. We um, made some quick models of those two, took them to schools and had the kids test them out and see which ones they liked. The one on the left, which is now called the snack garden is the one that won. Um, we were then able to get additional funding and a different set of students actually took the project forward and had it manufactured and worked on the marketing for it. Um, and now it's being used in schools for all of these tasting projects. So this was kind of a little side project that we had where um, students were able to do design, engage with the community, start to see how different kinds of design um, can impact people's lives and also really start to understand how long the road is between I have an idea, I have a good product and I get it to people, I have it manufactured, and people are successfully able to use it. Um, so there's always new opportunities like that popping up in addition to some kind of consistent opportunities that exist on campus. Um, a lot of the learning also happens between the students. I think I already mentioned this, so I won't belabor the point, but um, there's a lot of um, engagement, collaboration, and feedback between the students. We really work hard to create a cohort of students that are really gonna complement each other and that can teach each other a lot. And so um, we, and we encourage students to form a collaborative environment where they're um, constantly uh, interacting, critiquing each other, sharing the work and helping make each other better rather than a competitive environment where they feel like, oh, if I do well, then that means, um, you know, if someone else does well, then that means I'm not gonna do as well. Um, and then the last thing I wanna talk about is our grads. Um, so this is a picture from a few years ago of a graduating class. Um, and this is my favorite picture of all of their parents beaming and so proud of them. Um, I've been here for eight years uh, leading this program. And the thing that I love the most about it is seeing the transformation that students go through over the course of two years. Um, I think when I first started, actually our program was a year and a half and we extended it. Um, somebody asked about like the difference between our program and other programs. I think two years is the right amount of time. It gives you a lot of opportunity to learn. It gives you a summer to do an internship and it really gives students the time they need to um, do the work, learn the skills and have the personal growth that they want to get to the next level in their careers or in their pathways. Um, and so I love seeing all the students when they come in and they're all kind of green and nervous. And then when they graduate, they kind of own Penn um, and are super excited when they get out there in the world. And people, not just their parents, um, also people in industry see them um, differently when they graduate than they do when they first showed up. Um, so apologies for the super ugly slide. Um, but this was a way to get a lot of information out quickly. Um, our students get great jobs. Um, they get, they're getting jobs faster than they ever have. They're being snatched up by industry. We have three alums from last year who are working at Apple now. Um, our students tend to work um, in kind of three places. One is either they start a company or go to work in a small startup because they have a really um, diverse skill set. Um, and so they can do a lot in a startup. Um, the second place is in a large company like an Apple, and that could be as a product design engineer, it could be as a designer, it could be as a user experience designer. And then the third place they tend to go is in design consultancies like um, IDEO or Smart Design or um, RGA. Um, so those are kind of the paths, but because, you know, a student with a design background might end up with a different path than a student with an engineering background um, based on choice. Um, so there's there's kind of three main places, but, but the roles are pretty diverse, as you can see on this slide. Um, 
And then this is my last slide. Um, so I think I mentioned already, we're getting a new building and we're so excited. Uh, we have a studio space now. It is small and it's in the basement and it's a mess. Um, we are getting a space that's designed just for us and the kind of work we do and the way that we want to work do it in a building that's really optimized around design, um, making, engineering, and entrepreneurship and business. And so it's, I, I'm super excited about what that means for the program. It's going to mean that we can grow the program. So right now our classes are limited to 20. We have the opportunity to, to grow that, um, and which means that we're going to have even more opportunity for collaboration with external partners, and you'll have even more opportunity to learn from a diverse set of um, people. So um, next year is going to be pretty amazing, I will, I will say, and that's what our building will look like very soon. It's um, every time I walk by, it's a little bit more finished. So that's exciting. Um, so that's my last slide. Um, any questions? Reach out. Thanks. <laughs> I think I'll stop share. Oh, so there was one question about the personal statement and what we're looking for. Um, so I'll tell, and I think there was also a question about the portfolio, which I did not answer. So um, our admissions is done via a committee of folks from design, engineering, and business backgrounds who look at everything. Um, so the designers tend to put more emphasis on the portfolio. Uh, other people tend to put more emphasis on transcript. Other people tend to put more emphasis on the personal statement. What we're really looking for is like, who are you? Uh, what are you hoping to get out of the program? Can we give that to you? Can we do a good job at serving you? And uh, will you make a good fit and a good contribution to the cohort? So in your personal statement, we really wanna learn about um, what you do, um, who you are, why you wanna do IPD, and what you care about, um, what you think in integrated product design will help you achieve. Um, do we have a link requirement? Actually, we request no more than two pages. No more than two pages. That's great. Um, yeah, so we're reading a lot of stuff, um, and some of us are designers and we don't read that much. Um, so don't feel like you have to tell us your whole life story. Um, shorter is better. I would say in some ways the same with your portfolio. Don't feel nervous if you don't have 20 projects because we probably don't wanna look at 20 projects. We wanna look at like three to six projects that really tell a story about who you are, what your skills are, what your experience is. Um, for folks from business backgrounds, it's a little trickier because you might not have as many um, projects with beautiful pictures to show. Um, but really what we care about is um, who you are, how you think, your ability to go between conceptual thinking and analytical thinking, how you can tell a story um, as visually as possible. Um, but we don't really want, it's not the kind of portfolio where we want like one hero shot of a beautiful image. I would much rather hear about how you got to that end part than just the details of that end part. Um, so if you're looking for examples, I would um, look at design strategy um, portfolios or design strategy case studies. Um, if you have a business background for a little bit of a sense of how do you tell a story about process and things that are less visual um, and still be compelling. Um, yeah, what else am I missing? Sorry, I'm looking over at Mary. Uh, what other questions do you guys have? Um, I've got one. This is Max. I was just wondering when you say two pages, do you prefer double, two pages double spaced or single or does that really matter? <laughs> that doesn't really matter. All right. <laughs> Perfect. Double it is. <laughs> yeah, I think honestly, if you feel like you can say it with fewer words, do that. Um, Hello, this is Juan. I had a question about the average age and work experience of a typical class of accepted students. And if this year is still being limited to the number that you mentioned that was 20 earlier. Okay, uh, two good questions. So I don't know that we have an average age. I will tell you that we do look for diversity. So we definitely have some students who are just out of undergrad, and we definitely have some students who have 10 or more years of work experience. The majority is probably a few years out of school, um, but it's, pretty, it's a pretty wide range. 
Um, and we really like that range. Uh, students who are just out of school are really used to being in school and they're good at it. Students with a lot more work experience bring different skill sets and ways of working to the program. Um, and so we like to kind of cultivate those, all of those things in, in the cohort. Um, we do have the opportunity to admit more than 20 students this year. So we're really excited about that. We can go big. Um, but we're still, we're probably going to be somewhere between 20 and 30 is what I would say. It's still a pretty small program. Um, and we like it like that. We want it to be big enough that you guys have a lot of opportunities, but small enough that it feels like you get uh, personal attention and it feels like a strong community. Great. Thank you. I also have a very specific question about the English requirement. I don't know if I should ask that separately or you can ask it now. Okay, I, I completed my undergraduate degree in a university in the US, USC, and I've been living and working in the US since graduation, and I have an expired TOEFL. But I was wondering, because the IPD website says that the requirement could be waived at the discretion of the program. Um, so I was just wondering what the parameters of the English requirement tests are if I still need to take another test. I, I believe we waive the TOEFL if you've gotten your undergraduate degree from um, a school in which English was the primary language. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. You don't need a TOEFL. And you don't need to contact us to request one. Once we see your official transcript that indicates you graduated from an institution where English is the primary medium of instruction, we'll automatically grant the waiver. Okay, great. One last test. Awesome. Hello there, this is Samira. <clears throat> I was wondering what kind of ways students interact with faculty members because it's the the impression I get right now is that projects are very student run but I wanted to know where the faculty really stepped in oh interesting well um so are, are you talking about the final projects or just in general um in general outside of um, I know that we there are lectures um, and but with the projects, where do where do faculty members come in? So the final project course is taught by three faculty members. It's taught by myself, uh, JD Albert, whose background is in engineering, and Chris Murray, whose background is in design. Um, and we we do have weekly meetings where there's some lectures, there's some um, coaching and feedback. We bring in guest lectures to that class, but students do have weekly interactions with faculty where we're giving kind of advice. It's a studio model, but we're giving advice and coaching and direction to the teams. Um, and in addition to that, like if you're working on something that is the specialty of one of us, you might have side meetings like JD is amazing at CAD. So if a student is working on a model and has any questions about CAD, they'll schedule time to meet with him outside of class time. Um, and get a lot of support with that. Um, I would say across the board of the classes that you would take, maybe half of them will be studio-based models and half of them might be lecture or seminar. You can shift that balance depending on your interest, but um, so, so you do get a chance to have a variety of different kinds of interactions with faculty. Um, and as I said, there's also opportunities, like some students end up doing, working in faculty research labs over the summer, um, some students end up being um, TAs or teaching fellows for faculty in a variety of contexts. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, that's very helpful. I think, yeah, the weekly meetings is something that makes a lot of um, sense in a, pro in a studio environment. Yeah, I mean, we, we have class time for all of our, our studio classes. Yeah. Um, and in IPD 552, for example, which we're, I'm teaching right now, that class is about half lecture, half coaching and feedback. All right, thank you. Sure. Hello, this is Celeste again. Um, I was wondering if you could mention uh, the name of the professor who was working with biological design. Oh yeah, his name is Orkan Telhan, T-E-L-H-A-N, and he's a mechanic. <laughs> he loves IPD students. 
Wow, okay, great, thank you. Yeah, I didn't, none of these, none of you are in the Philly area, but there's an amazing exhibit right now called Design for Different Futures at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which showcases Orcon's work and also Mark Yim, who's the program director of IPD alongside me, um, and also the Leah pregnancy test is in there. So there's a lot of cool people that you would have access to. Follow-up question on yeah. Professor Tahan. Is he currently pursuing any kind of research and is there opportunities for IPD students to participate in research with professors? Yes, uh, so he does, he does a combination of research and industry projects and he most summers looks to hire IPD students actually. Um, so there's definitely opportunities with him and also other faculty on campus. Um, the best way, you know, it's, it's hard when you first get started. The best thing to do is to take a class with a professor who you think you might want to work alongside with um, and build that relationship. Um, I also often get emails from faculty who are looking for IPD students to do various projects. Our students, there's not that many of them, but they have a pretty unique skill set on campus. Um, so I'm often passing on opportunities to students for those kinds of things. Anything that we forgot to say? I think you did good in covering all the program information. Okay. Deadline is February 1st. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss that deadline. Don't miss the deadline. Okay, any last questions? I think we're good. Thank you guys all for your time. I really appreciate it. You have our email addresses, we are find all, both of us are findable online very easily if you Google us. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out and ask. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks so much. Have Thanks a great rest of your here. day.